Hello and welcome to IB Biology Notes with Dr. Kimo. This is B12 proteins. This video is about amino acids, peptides, and of course proteins. In higher level, it's also about uh, the structure of the proteins. Proteins consist of monomers called amino acids. Each amino acid has an alpha carbon, and that alpha carbon binds an amine group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen atom, and a side chain called the R group. The amine group is basic and the carboxyl group is acidic. That means that the amino acid is amphiprotic. It, it can act both as a base and as an acid. The R group can be many different things. Two amino acids can be linked together to form a dipeptide. This is a condensation reaction between a carboxyl group and an amine group. Water is released and the resulting bond is called a peptide bond. Two or more linked amino acids form a polypeptide. Shorter polypeptides are also called oligopeptides. Then uh, you can talk about dipeptides if there's only two amino acids and tripeptides if there's three amino acids. Polypeptides are the main component of proteins. We obtain amino acids from food. And our ribosomes make polypeptides from 20 different amino acids. Each amino acid differs by its R group, and that's illustrated on the right, where all 20 amino acids can be found. You can see that each of them has uh, the same backbone with an amine group and a carboxyl group, and then they have their own type of uh, side chain of R group. Plants can make their own amino acids through photosynthesis, but animals obtain amino acids from food. Humans can synthesize 11 of these amino acids from other amino acids by modification of the R group, and these are called non-essential amino acids. The rest, nine of them, are essential amino acids which means that we cannot synthesize them and we need them from food. The essential ones can be seen here in yellow and obviously you are not expected to know details like this. Phenylketonuria is a condition associated with the synthesis of amino acids. Most people can synthesize the amino acid tyrosine from the amino acid phenylalanine. This is done by an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase, PAH. However, people with a rare genetic mutation in the PAH gene cannot synthesize tyrosine, and they have phenylketonuria, PKU. What this leads to is that phenylalanine and its metabolites accumulate and can cause severe mental retardation. Also, tyrosine becomes an essential amino acid. However, newborns are routinely screened with a blood test and there is effective treatment. That is, diet very low in protein throughout life to keep the phenylalanine at a, an acceptable level. Also, aspartame is to be completely avoided because aspartame is broken down to phenylalanine in the body. Aspartame is an artificial sweetener which can be found in uh, things like um, soda, candy, diet foods. 
There is also a medicine which enhances the function of the enzyme PAH. But uh, for this to work, the PAH enzyme needs to have some functionality left. The number of different polypeptide chains that a cell can make is essentially unlimited. Let's do some math. There are 20 amino acids, and if you want to make a dipeptide, you have 20 times 20 different alternatives. That's 400 different alternatives. If you want to make a tripeptide, the number is 20 times 20 times 20. That's 8,000 different alternatives. A polypeptide with 100 amino acids. There, the number of alternatives is larger than the number of atoms in the observable universe. Yet many polypeptides are much longer than 100 amino acids. The longest human polypeptide is titin, present in muscle with more than 34,000 amino acids. The illustration shows alpha amylase, which is present in saliva. It consists of a polypeptide with close to 500 amino acids. Proteins are sensitive to temperature and pH. Proteins form 3D structures through bonds or interactions between R groups. If you're doing higher level biology, this is something you will be learning more about later in this video. The 3D structure is essential for protein function, and the bonds and interactions are generally weak and sensitive to changes in temperature or pH. Denaturation is when a protein loses its 3D structure, and that's what happens if you, for example, fry an egg. Then the water-soluble proteins in the egg are heated and denatured. They lose their 3D structure, and they become insoluble in water. Denaturation is usually irreversible. Now we are moving to additional higher level territory. R group diversity leads to diversity in protein form and function. The chemical properties of the R groups of amino acids are major determinants of the properties of a polypeptide. The properties of R groups include things like they can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic and that some hydrophilic ones are polar but never charged, whereas others can become charged by acting as an acid or as a base, and that some hydrophobic ones are aromatic, so they have a ring, whereas some are not. Sometimes amino acids are modified after protein synthesis, for example, to make collagen more stable. Protein structure has four levels of complexity. We call them primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Primary structure is the sequence of amino acids, so in which order the amino acids are linked together. Secondary structure is alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. These are regular substructures with amino acids that are not that far from each other. On the chain. Tertiary structure is the three dimensional structure of the polypeptide. And quaternary structure is the assembly of two or more polypeptides. Some proteins consist of just one polypeptide, whereas other proteins consist of more than one polypeptide. Let's have a closer look at the, these levels of complexity. The amino acid sequence of a polypeptide is its primary structure. And the backbone of a polypeptide is a repeating pattern of covalently linked carbon and nitrogen atoms. The bond angles are tetrahedral and the bonds can rotate freely. 
and this allows polypeptides to fold in almost any way. So it's kind of like beads and a string, and you can fold it any way you like. The primary structure of a polypeptide determines its structure at other levels. A protein's treaty structure arises from the many complex bonds and interactions between R groups. And a problem for scientists has been, and still is, that uh, although it is easy to find out the primary structure of a polypeptide, it has proved very difficult to calculate the treaty structure of the polypeptide based on the primary structure. And you know, the treaty structure being essential for protein function, this has been a problem. And as I said, it still is a problem, but there are some very promising technologies being developed. And uh, the illustration on this slide shows um, the predicted 3D structure of a protein called FOXP2. And uh, this 3D structure is predicted based on the primary structure, so, so the order in which the amino acids are connected together. Secondary structure. You know that each amino acid has a carboxyl group and an amine group. And in a polypeptide, when the amino acids have undergone condensation reactions, then each of these amino acids has a C, a carbon, connected to an oxygen with a double bond, and a nitrogen connected to a hydrogen. And the oxygen is slightly negative, the hydrogen is slightly positive. So they can form hydrogen bonds. This results in two common structures, uh, alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. And these are the secondary structure of polypeptides. Tertiary structure. The folding of the entire polypeptide into a 3D structure. This 3D structure is stabilized by bonds and interactions between R groups. And there are four main types of bonds or interactions. Ionic bonds between positive and negative R groups. And uh, this ionic bond is formed between an amine group, which uh, has become positively charged when accepting a proton, and a carboxyl group, which has become negatively charged when donating a proton. So that's an ionic bond. Hydrogen bonds between polar R groups. Well, you know what hydrogen bonds are. Covalent disulfide bonds or bridges or linkages between cysteines. And cysteine is uh, one of those 20 amino acids. And finally, hydrophobic interactions between nonpolar R groups. There are two broad categories of amino acids, nonpolar, which are hydrophobic, and polar, which are hydrophilic. This is also important for the tertiary structure of polypeptides. Let's first see how this plays out in globular proteins. Hemoglobin is an example of a globular protein, and it has hydrophilic amino acids on the outside and hydrophobic amino acids on the inside. Now, globular proteins exist in aqueous solutions like the cytoplasm. And uh, the polypeptide will spontaneously fold such that the hydrophobic R groups will end up in the middle, sort of facing away from the water, from, from the aqueous uh, cytoplasm. Whereas the hydrophilic R groups 
will end up on the outside facing the water because they are hydrophilic and those on the inside are hydrophobic. This stabilizes protein structure in an aqueous environment. Here's another example of how hydrophobic versus hydrophilic amino acids are important for tertiary structure. Integral proteins. What you see here is an integral protein partially embedded in a phospholipid bilayer, so in a membrane, could be the cell membrane. The hydrophobic part is in contact with the membrane, in green marked the P. The hydrophilic parts are either outside, red marked with an E, or inside, yellow marked with an I. And this stabilizes the protein and keeps it in place. Another example are channel proteins. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions keep the protein in place, just like is the case with in integral proteins. But in channel proteins, what you also have is a hydrophilic inner surface. And this allows hydrophilic molecules to go through the, the phospholipid bilayer, through this channel. The width of the channel and the distribution of charges determines then what can pass through the channel. And finally, quaternary structure. Some proteins consist of more than one polypeptide. And some proteins have one or more non-polypeptide components. In such proteins, the 3D arrangement of all its subunits is its quaternary structure. Proteins with amino acids only are called non-conjugated proteins. And uh, proteins with the non-polypeptide subunits are called conjugated proteins. Many enzymes are conjugated proteins. And before we finish, let's consider the relationship between form and function in proteins. And form and function go hand in hand. Globular proteins are rounded and they have a tertiary structure due to R-group interactions. Hemoglobin is set one such globular protein, as you know by now. Fibrous proteins, on the other hand, are elongated, thread-like, and have no folding into tertiary structure. Instead, several polypeptides link together with hydrogen bonds to form long filamentous quaternary structures. An example of this is collagen, which forms strong fibers in skin, tendons, and cartilage. That's all for now. See you next time.